Dora is a graduate of St. Hilda's College, Oxford, and holds a PhD from the Warburg Institute. Her dissertation on the Studiolo became a wonderful book, The Scholar in a Study, Ownership and Experience in Renaissance Italy, which is much read and much beloved here at the BTC. Her long and impressive list of publications includes the monumental catalog of Italian Renaissance ceramics in the British Museum, which she published together with Timothy Wilson in 2009, as well as articles too numerous to name on a broad variety of topics. Her book, Objects of Virtue, written with Luke Sison and published in 2002, is also much beloved here and a kind of textbook for our students of Renaissance and early modern. Last spring, she published a Rothschild Renaissance, Treasures from the Waddesdon Bequest, in conjunction with a major new gallery on the ground floor of the British Museum, of which she is the curator and played a major role in planning and organization. Other memorable exhibitions which she has mounted include Shakespeare, Staging the World, which took place in 2012 during the Olympics in London. Um, and she was, uh, in a conjunction with that, she was co-author with Jonathan Bate of a book with the same title, as well as another book called Shakespeare's Britain, um, and all of that in 2012. Museum, she's contributed substantially to the Enlightenment Gallery, which all of you will know, and to the special exhibitions Treasures of Heaven, Michelangelo, Durer and His Legacy, and Pottery in the Making, to name just a few. She is a frequent presence on the radio and television in Britain, and has also taught and directed student projects at the University College London, University of Cambridge, Queen Mary College, and the Courtauld. In addition to her work at the British Museum, she has collaborated on many exhibitions in other venues, including Art and Love in Renaissance Italy, which took place here at the Met in 2008, and on which I had the pleasure of working with her and learning a great deal from her and that, um, the, the many wonderful meetings that led up to that exhibition. As you might imagine, she's a frequent speaker at scholarly conferences and symposia. This evening, Dora will speak on wine, women, and the glory of Venice, masterpieces of Renaissance glass. Welcome, Dora. Thank you very much, Debbie. Can you hear me at the back of the room? Yeah. Well, if at any point you can't, would you just wave your arms around? <laughs> Thank you very much for that much too generous introduction. I don't recognize myself at all in all of that. Um, it, it sounds exhausting, and I can say it was exhausting. Those things. But I hope that uh, my talk this evening will be fun for some of you and will at least transport you to Shakespeare's Venice. Venice in the late 16th and very early 17th centuries. And I hope that it will encourage you to ask questions at the end and that we'll have a good discussion because that is the purpose of the talk. Right. The British Museum holds one of the world's finest collections of Venetian glass, which was bequeathed by Felix Slade in 1868. The enameled Venetian of Venetian style glass, known as Façon de Venise, is one of the highlights of the collection. It allows us to trace the diaspora of Venetian craftsmen from Murano to glassmaking centers all over Europe and to document the high regard for Venetian culture and fashion in Europe from the late 15th century to its peak around 1600. Distinguishing between glasses made in Venice for export to Germany and Bohemia and those actually made by glassmakers north of the Alps is extremely difficult. The origin of a key group of glasses in the British Museum was first discussed in 1911 and is still hotly debated. That group includes this charming glass, made in a German form known as a Stangenglas, enameled on one side with the arms of the Austrian or German Haller family. On the other side is this enameled figure of a lady. I'm showing you two views here. She wears her hair in a Venetian style in high horns and her white silk dress with a high lace collar, long corseted bodice, and plunging cleavage is also a Venetian fashion. She smiles as she holds out a standing glass of wine or beer in a witty invitation to the person about to drink from the glass. Made for a German client, perhaps to order in Venice, this glass bridges Venetian and German culture through the figure of an alluring and very definitely Venetian woman as an object of desire. I'm going to show you images of stunning glasses from the British Museum and from other collections in Europe and America. The talk has grown out of 26 years as a curator at the British Museum, always thinking about the same kinds of questions. 
the relationships between people and things, analysing taste, demand and supply in a way that always starts with the objects themselves, their makers and their contemporary users. Um, you've had an exhaustive list of my books, so I won't go through that. But um, glass has appeared in all my books from the very beginning, in some aspect or another. Um, and I'm very, very grateful in concocting this talk, not just to glass specialists, such as Christina Tonini and Rosa Barafia in Venice, but cultural historians such as Deborah Howard, Olinka Rubiak, Jackie Musacchio, Elizabeth Semmelhack, Patricia Fortini-Brown, Jonathan Bate, and the late Jonathan Hale. But this talk is as much about Renaissance Venice as a city, its self-image, its people, and its visitors, as it is about masterpieces of Venetian glass. So, of course, I begin by showing you Jacopo de Barbieri's famous view of Venice of around 1498 to 1500, which lays out the city as experienced by the foreign dignitary and the merchant, the tourist and the stranger. The more I thought about my subject and the interaction between glasses and their first consumers and collectors, the more Shakespearean the subject became. There's good reason for that. Italy was one of the most important of Shakespeare's imagined places. And within Italy, Venice had a whole a very special hold on the English. A fair city, an open city, a multicultural population, a place of fashionable innovation and questionable morals. In Venice, Londoners saw an image of their own desires and fears, their own future. A strong seam of ambivalence towards Venice, particularly towards Venetian women, appears in Shakespeare's Venetian plays, The Merchant of Venice and Othello, and also on Venetian and Venetian style glasses to which I'll return. But connoisseurship of all things Venetian was led largely in England by Sir Henry Wootton, appointed in 1604 as the first post-Reformation ambassador to Venice. This bird's eye view of Venice, painted by Eduardo Filetti in 1611, is his souvenir as an elite tourist. Wootton left it to the Fellows of Eton College in memory of himself, this picture of a wonderful city which seems to float. Isn't that a wonderful description of that picture? It was admired at Eton by Samuel Pepys in 1665, and wonder of wonders, it's still there. I'm showing you here Fioletti's signature under his depiction of the Zitella Church on the Giudecca. At the center of the picture, in the Piazzetta di San Marco, is this tiny detail, which is about this big, of a momaria, a betrothal mask held to celebrate the union of two powerful Venetian families. Francesco Sansovino describes these masks as one of the many public spectacles of Venice in his Guide to the City. Shakespeare, of course, includes wedding masks in A Midsummer Night's Dream and in The Tempest as part of the play within a play aspect of his writing, which I'm sure would not have been lost on Henry Wootton when he viewed this painting. There is performance, spectacle, and theatricality at the heart of Eduardo Filetti's vision of Venice. And interestingly, there's a woman dressed in white in the middle of the makeshift platform which serves as a stage the kind of thing which English visitors, used to seeing boys playing women's parts in the London playhouses, found particularly shocking. Mountebanks performed on raised platforms in a similar way in the Piazzetta di San Marco twice a day, and these shows often included a female character among the masked figures of the Commedia dell'arte, called Lina Morata, who accompanied herself on a lute. This is Giacomo Franco's engraving, of such a performance from his series of prints showing the dress and customs of Venetian men and women, which was published in Venice in 1610. It's not surprising that depictions of mountebank performances appeared as part of the image bank produced for the Venetian tourist in the tradition of the theater of the world, a means of understanding the world's people through their dress and their customs. The challenge presented by Venetian women to Northern European Protestant visitors was a moral one. In 1590, Sir Henry Wootton, visiting Venice, commented on the difficulty of distinguishing between respectable married women and prostitutes in the street. The English traveler Fiennes Morrison commented that, both honest and dishonest women are lisciate fina la fossa, that is, made up into the very grave. Costume prints like the Giacomo Franco portrait type of a courtesan, shown here, and costume books, played on the anxiety and the fascination of interpreting clothing as an identifier of rank and fashion. Cesare Vecellio's book, Degli Abiti, Antichi et Moderni, which was a publishing sensation in Venice in 1590, was intended to bring the global cultures within one compass in presenting a theater of the world through dress. Both Vecellio and Franco were also advertising the character of their own modern city, Venice. 
This lively drawing in pen and brown ink by Franco, who was well known as a designer, engraver and publisher in the Frezzeria in Venice, gives a sense of his engagement with Venetian women as subjects. In 2012, as Debbie explained, I curated an exhibition, Shakespeare Staging the World at the British Museum. One section of the exhibition looked at Venice as the city of dreams for Shakespeare and his audiences, the city of luxury and excess, famous for its fair women and for its sex trade, a city known for its openness to strangers or immigrants and aliens, renowned as a trading republic and as a bulwark against the Ottoman Turk. Londoners saw in Venice something to admire and criticize at the same time, and Venice was the proxy setting for London on the stage of the London Playhouse. This section of the exhibition explored the world of the merchant of Venice and of Othello, and in so doing, I displayed two examples of enameled glass from the BM's collection, which presented fascinating insights into the way in which Venice was regarded and viewed by contemporary Europeans. This talk builds upon that experience, as I am convinced that we need to consider not only the technical finesse and art of Venetian glass, but its contemporary status and significance for the people who first commissioned, owned, and handled it. And when I started to think about that, women began to emerge as muses, patrons, and consumers in ways which I hadn't really expected, hence my theme. Admiration for Venice's famous crystalline glass, made in Murano, had a long history in Europe, as documented by this famous beaker in the British Museum, signed by Maestro Aldrovandin in the early 14th century. Glass of this type reached as far west as Cornwall and as far east as Estonia within a few years of production, indicating the scale of the market for luxury Venetian glass long before the technical breakthroughs of the 15th century. Why master glassmakers stopped signing their pieces like this is a mystery, and it makes any kind of attribution and dating for glass a great deal more difficult and sometimes impossible. We know about the great breakthroughs of the 15th and 16th centuries, not just from surviving glasses, but from documents in the Venetian state archives concerning the tightly controlled glassmaking community. These include recipes and legislation regarding the imports of raw materials. Production in Murano was restricted to seven months of the year culminating in the annual St. Mark's Fair, La Sensa, at which the latest products were displayed and sold. Glassmakers were forbidden to work during the recess or to move elsewhere, though artisans desperate for work set up glass houses abroad despite the opposition of the Council of Ten, mainly from the 1540s, moving to Antwerp from 1541 and London by 1548. We have written references to the most famous glassmakers, who were as highly regarded as court artists, like Angelo Barovier, who came from one of Murano's most famous glass dynasties. We have inventory references to glass belonging to famous collectors, from Cardinal Francesco Gonzaga to Matthias Corvinus in Hungary and Henry VIII, King of England. Some glasses are enameled with coats of arms which document their history and the lives of their patrons, like this flask in the British Museum, which is made out of highly prized white glass, enameled with the portcullis badge of Henry VII on one side and with his portrait copied from one of his gold coins on the other. It must have been a diplomatic gift or a very special order, perhaps placed by one of the many Italian merchants or bankers working in London in Henry VII's reign. It dates to around 1500 to 1508. Most fascinating of all are the legal records of lawsuits between rival glassmakers over their products, from which we learn that there were two women among specialist enamelers in the 15th century, though we can't identify their products. We also have the technical treatise on metals by Georg Agricola from 1556, which illustrates a Murano glass furnace in operation and describes key techniques. Writing on metallurgy in 1540, the metal worker Vanuccio Biringuccio advertised Murano products. The best glasswork which is made in our times, and that which is of greater beauty, more varied colouring and more admirable skill than that of any other place, is made in Murano. In addition to colouring glass with all possible tints, they make them very clear and transparent, like true and natural rock crystal, and ornament them with paintings and other very fine enamels. Admiration for Murano glass drew eager consumers to the annual fair on Ascension Day at St. Mark's to see the latest styles. Trying one's hands at glass blowing was already on the tourist itinerary by 1611, when Thomas Corriott, who travelled from Somerset to Venice on foot, had a go. I passed in a gondola to Pleasant Murano, distant about a little mile from the city, where they make their delicate Venetian glasses, so famous over all Christendom for the incomparable fineness thereof, and in one of their working houses made a glass myself. 
Of course, the glass you are here, which is blown and molded from filigree glass, embedded with twisted glass canes, represents an ultra-sophisticated product which could only have been produced by a master craftsman at the height of his powers and not by a visiting tourist. But it's exactly this kind of glass, with its network of twisted white canes within a clear glass body, known as vetra ritorti, which represented the latest taste in fashion and novelty. It is the kind of thing which Venetian courtesans, with their renowned taste for luxury, like to show off in their bedchambers and apartments to which they welcome their clients. So it's no surprise to read in the 1569 inventory of a leading Venetian courtesan, Giulia Lombardo, that she had a study, an unusual space for a woman to set up for herself, and evidence of the kind of cultural ambition for which courtesans were renowned, which was filled with 50 glass vases and flasks, worked in an even more complex filigree glass known as areticello because of the net or rete of white canes that was used to make it. I'm showing you a perfume sprinkler, just the kind used by courtesans, and a bowl made using this technique with details of their making to give you a sense of Julia's sophisticated taste. I'll return to courtesans later, but the broader story of women as patrons and consumers of Venetian glass starts much earlier. This magnificent blue glass in the British Museum dates from around 1450. The foot has been molded and blown, then gilded, while the large cup has been blown and then decorated with a pincered blue trail at the base. It's enameled and gilded all over the cup with a continuous band of narrative decoration. The imagery is lively but inept with the general theme of the triumph of chaste love over profane love. This photo shows the narrative enameled on the glass as the glass rotates on a turntable. At the right, a naked Venus reclines on a fish-shaped chariot. In front of her is a woman with a flaming torch, symbolizing marriage, and in front of her a centaur, representing lust, fighting with a warrior. The chariot in the middle shows a clothed woman with a bound, naked figure of a young man parading on another chariot. Cupid is often shown bound in this way, but this youth lacks wings, so might represent love made captive. Before them, Cupids ride on geese, accompanied by groups of dancing nymphs bearing food and drink. The theme of a triumphal procession suggests that this is a betrothal goblet, though no documentary evidence for this kind of use has yet been found. Marriage in Renaissance Italy comprised a series of customs demanding complex social exchanges, gifts and rituals around objects, special art objects, commissioned to stress the individual, their virtue and their lineage, the importance of fertility and procreation. In Florence, which has been far the most studied, this is the moment that as a young man you enter the art market. Glasses with this kind of imagery, or heads of a man and a woman, are thought to have been commissioned for the couple to drink wine from at a particular moment. The exchange of rings between the couple had its own ceremony, followed by dinner, music, dancing, and spectacle. When Lucrezia Borgia married An Annibale Bentivoglio, Lord of Bologna, in 1487, there was a staged battle between erotic love and chastity. Weddings were often described as triumphs, and triumphal processions often appear on specially commissioned painted furniture and objects, like this one. Perhaps the cup had a lid for formal presentation for the couple to drink from. There is another glass with exactly the same scenes enameled on it in the Louvre, which has a lid. Or they could have been used for sugared almonds or confetti as part of a dining set in glass used at a marriage feast. Confetti in silver cups are shown in this panel in the London's National Gallery, one in a set of three made by the Griselda master to commemorate a double wedding in the Spanocchi family in Siena in 1494. The confetti are in shallow silver bowls set in front of the diners, perhaps best seen in this detail. This and other much earlier visual references, like this detail from a fresco of 1444, which shows confetti in cups, might suggest that the British Museum glass had a similar function. Young brides were supposed to offer confetti to visitors in their new home, according to contemporary etiquette, References to chaste love on this glass would suit that function exactly. It was from the late 15th century that glass commanded the attention of elite patrons across Europe. This beaker in the Corning Glass Museum is another betrothal piece made in Murano around 1494 to commemorate a marriage with one of Nuremberg's leading families, the Beheim. On one side is enameled the Archangel Michael slaying the dragon. The other side shows Catherine of Alexandria with her attributes of a palm and a sword with which she was beheaded. At her feet is the Roman emperor who, she try, who had tried to force her to marry and then condemned her to death when she said she was already married to Christ. The wheel at her right side, which is almost invisible through loss of gilding, alludes to the intended instrument of her execution. 
it broke before it could be used, so she was beheaded with a sword. The unusual combination of Saints Michael and Catherine and the Beheim arms suggests that this was made for the marriage of Michael IV Beheim and Katharina Lochnerin, who were married in Nuremberg on the 7th of July, 1495. He was a civic official in the city. She was the daughter of a rich merchant who controlled the trade between Nuremberg and Venice, which might explain the story behind the making of the glass and the placing of the Ordo Murano. The Beheims and other Nuremberg families had tastes for Venetian luxury objects. This glass and the armorial beaker in pair with it, which is now in a private collection in Bremen, are early documents for the taste among the Nuremberg city elite for Murano glass. The glass represents a new aesthetic, and my guess is that it was at least as treasured as the silver gilt cups made to commemorate marriages and document family history in Nuremberg. St. Catherine on the beaker was not just the namesake of the bride, but was a holy virgin, seen as a model for Christian wives on account of her mystical marriage with Christ. Gerard David's painting of the Virgin and Child with St. Catherine, St. Barbara, St. Mary Magdalene and Adona shows Catherine being given the wedding ring by the infant Christ, a much-loved iconography around 1500. So St. Catherine's presence on the beaker probably has a double significance. This glass is about a married couple, but more specifically about a married woman and the virtue she should espouse to make her more like her namesaint. This sophisticated betrothal goblet in the BM dates from the end of the 15th century. It presents the heads of a man and a woman. The busts are framed in garlands of laurel bound with ribbons, held by putti standing on grass against a stippled background which heightens the color of the deep green glass. The garland is in itself an allusion to marriage, as giving a garland to a favored lover was part of a betrothal and wedding ritual. The contemporary Florentine print shown here shows a woman crowning her lover with a wreath. The man's profile on the glass is accompanied by a text in Venetianized Latin, such as is often found on these glasses, reading, Amor vol fe, love requires faithfulness. The motto is classical and Latin in origin, taken up in humanist circles in the 15th century as a noble ancient saying on virtue. The full quotation is, love requires faith, and where there is no faith, love is powerless, as shown on this Florentine auto print of around 1465. The second engraving from the same set shows the chastisement of Cupid, in which one of the girls on the left has the motto embroidered on her sleeve. Prints in this group are unusually shaped and are thought to have been used to decorate boxes for inexpensive betrothal gifts to hold rings and other love tokens presented to brides. On the other side of the glass is this, the woman of the couple. The glass can be dated to around 1490 to 1510 by the dress and hairstyles of the pair. Carpaccio's famous painting of two Venetian ladies on an altana, circa 1495 to 1500 in the Correa, provides an exact parallel in reverse, including the blonde hair, the pearls, the puff chemise seen through the sleeves of a low-cut bodice in rich patterned silk velvet. Carpaccio's painting was long thought, as you, I'm sure you all know, to depict two courtesans, but it actually shows a young bride identified by her pearl necklace and an older woman. They're waiting for their husbands to return from a duck hunt on the lagoon. Though that part of the painting has long been separated from the two women and is now in the Getty. On the right is a Carpaccio portrait drawing from the Ashmolean to show how an enameler might have taken the Carpaccio inspiration, perhaps through workshop drawings made for their own use after paintings, or possibly by borrowing drawings from Carpaccio's workshop. The famous Carpaccio cycle of St. Ursula, another inspiration for glass painters, was in the Accademia di Sant'Orsola, very close to the Fondamenta Nuove, where boats still leave for Murano today. So is it fanciful to imagine a glass enameler having a little moment to take a look and sketch a few heads that appealed, and then use them to sell glasses in a fashionable style? Carpaccio's influence is also seen on this exquisite opaque glass bowl in gleaming white, enameled in the center with a man's head and the Venetianized Latin motto, Ego vobis ver servo son, I am in your service. Latimo, or milk white opaque glass, was perfected in Venice around 1490. It's made by the addition of tin and lead oxides as whitening agents, which make a perfect field for painted enamel decoration. According to documents in the Venetian archives, Latimo was a luxury glass only produced from around 1490 to 1512. The famous romance published in Venice in 1495, the Hypnorota Machia Polyphili, even refers to a stone wall having a whiteness excelling that even of Latimo glass from Murano. 
and includes woodcuts very similar to the designs painted on these glasses. Only about 14 pieces of this luxury glass survive. This exquisite wine bowl is in a pair with a bowl in Vienna, enameled at its center with a woman's head and the Latin legend, Amor Massalie, or Love Assaults Me, another tag from the language of chivalric love. The head painted on it is very similar to that on the green glass I showed you in the BM and dates from the same period. Again, one can find close parallels to the Carpaccio painting of two ladies on a balcony, which I showed you earlier. This turquoise goblet in the British Museum is another thought to be betrothal piece. These three views show how the cup is covered with an enamel scale pattern in red, highlighted with gilding, framing two randals with pairs of lovers. Their hair and dress represent European aristocratic fashion of the very late 1490s and almost certainly before 1500. They're shown as half-length figures in a landscape, lit on one side by a sun with shining rays and on the other with a moon in a night sky streaked with cloud. In the sunlit scene, I'll show you details of this in a minute, uh, a couple stand close together with a fawn lying in front of them. A fawn or deer often appears beneath stylized sun rays on contemporary glass and myolica, perhaps as an emblem of love and faithfulness as on this beautiful dish in the British Museum. The young man on the glass wears a cap over his long hair, while the woman wearing a cloak seems to hold up her hand and point to the heavens in emphasis as she speaks to him. On the other, moonlit side, a man faces the same woman, her flowing blonde hair picked out in yellow enamel and gilding. He gazes into her eyes and places his hand on her breast. They might be a betrothed or married couple in their wedding finery. The exact interpretation of the narrative is completely unknown. It's likely to be an allegory of love or chastity of the kind found on contemporary works of art made to commemorate marriage. Venetian turquoise glass is incredibly rare. There are two examples in the Victorian Albert Museum in London. The first is a footed bowl enameled with a sophisticated trellis design of twining tendrils, probably made and enameled in the same Murano workshop as the British Museum goblet and shares the same aesthetic as well as technique. The beaker on the right is enameled with the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, known to most of us through Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. It's very different from the goblet in its making and the bowl on the left, as it's made of dichroic glass, which changes color by transmitted light from translucent turquoise to deep red, and it's much more crudely enameled. Imitations of turquoise in glass had long been made by Muslim craftsmen, and as Sheila Camby's here, I just want to say that in the Seljuk exhibition, now on at the, at the Met, which um, Sheila curated, there is a wonderful turquoise glass flask um, from the Corning Museum, which I really recommend you go and see. Um, but this wonderful bowl, which was made in Egypt in the 900s, was long part of the treasury of the Cathedral of San Marco in Venice and may have stimulated curiosity and ambition among Venetian craftsmen. Copying precious and semi-precious stones in glass was a Venetian Renaissance preoccupation. Turquoises from Khurasan had special status and were set into rings, including marriage rings, and were thought to have amuletic properties, particularly in preserving harmony between couples. When Shakespeare's Shylock realizes he's lost his wife's turquoise ring, he laments, it was my turquoise, I had it of Leia when I was a bachelor. I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. Perhaps the choice of turquoise for a betrothal glass was significant for Renaissance patrons, amuletic, fashionable, extremely rare. Only two groups of fragments of turquoise glass have so far been identified in excavations, and they occur in elite late 15th century contexts. One from a house used by wealthy Genoese merchants and Venetian diplomats in Southampton in England, and one from a rich convent, Santa Chiara, in Padua. I like to think of the nuns in Padua having such luxurious tastes. You can see just how close the fragments from Padua are to the BM goblet, when you compare them to the turquoise goblet in the British Museum as taken apart for conservation. So those are the fragments from Santa Chiara, my own photographs, please excuse, not very good quality. And that is the goblet that I showed you in the British Museum, uh, which was broken long before it arrived in the Rothschild collection in 1866. And we took it apart um, to re-adhere it much better for the new gallery. And when we took it apart, we were able to examine it much more closely. A rare reference from 1496 in the Venetian archives mentions four little jugs of turquoise glass. 
and an inventory listing the possessions of the court painter to the Gonzaga of Mantua, Andrea Mantegna, confirms the status of turquoise glass. Mantegna owned a little flask of turquoise glass with the device of the sun upon it, enameled with his personal device or impresa of a sunburst, which his patron might have given him to use as a special privilege. As the sunburst was formerly a Gonzaga device, Mantegna was very proud of this and had it worked on his gold livery collar, blazoned on his dining silver and embroidered on the coverlet of his bed. His little water flask, it was kept with an enameled beaker upended on the neck, was obviously a treasured possession. And it may have looked quite like the one I've already shown you, this little flask with the portrait head of Henry VII of England, copied from a coin and accompanied by his own arms and devices in the British Museum, which was obviously another special commission from a Venetian workshop. Mantegna's flask evokes the context for the Wadston goblet as the rarest of the rare in Venetian glass of the late 15th century. Could it have been commissioned by the Gonzaga, possibly by Isabella, as a gift to their artist? It was probably beyond Mantegna's pocket and must have been a very special order. The link with the Gonzaga is telling. Isabella d'Este, Marchioness of Mantua and wife of Federico Gonzaga, was one of the leading art patrons and collectors of her day. She beleaguered her agent in Venice, Lorenzo da Pavia, with letters about glasses he ordered for her in Murano. Over 30 years, she showed her awareness of the latest fashions and techniques, returning glasses that were not to her liking and suggesting precise improvements. In 1496, she wrote to Lorenzo in Venice, we received the 20 glasses which you wrote of having sent in your letter, which are pleasing as to their height, but not in their profile, since the foot is as broad as the cup. Therefore, we desire you to have made another 20 of this size, but that they should be made smaller at the foot and have the little gold border around the lip made so that it actually covers the lip and so that there remains no plain glass above the gold border. Looking at the green and the turquoise glasses I've shown you, which date from the same time as her letter, it's evident that she would not have accepted their proportions. The foot of each is wider than the cup to provide stability, perhaps that explains why they survived. And the gilding doesn't reach the lip of the glass, so they didn't match Isabella's stringent requirements. A more exacting patron could not be found, and it confirms my suspicions about women as commissioners as well as users of Venetian glass. The delicate engraved plate on the left takes that story later. It's made from slightly greyish glass engraved with the point of a diamond with grotesques, dragons and masks to form a kind of lacework or embroidery design, a short-lived elite taste in Italy. Venetian craftsmen specialised in glass engraving like this and it was later taken by them over the Alps to Antwerp, London, the Tyrol, although it was always identified with Venetian glasses. A pastor in Silesia, Johann Mutesius, described in a sermon of 1562 all sort of festooning engraved by diamond point on bright Venetian glasses decorated with scrolls scratched upon them, which I think goes rather well with these designs. On the plate at the top, the arms engraved at the centre are for Isabella de' Medici, the daughter of Cosimo, Duke of Florence, and for her husband, Paolo Giordano Orsini, who married in 1588. 1558. Isabella, shown here in a portrait by Alessandro Lori, was highly educated, cultivated and independent in spirit. She was murdered, probably at the order of her husband or even of her own family, after an alleged love affair in 1576. Her death has inspired Caroline Murphy's book, Murder of a Medici Princess, which was published in 2008. Only two plates remain from this sophisticated glass service for use at dessert. It was either made for the marriage or for the couple's use until the wife's murder in 1576, so it documents a tragic story. Recent work on Italian Renaissance ceramic services with the arms of a couple suggests that women were often prime movers in commissioning sets. French noble women, such as Anne of Brittany and Catherine de Foix, Queen of Navarre, showed a marked taste for Venetian glass services. Perhaps we should all look harder for evidence which connects women and the glass of Murano. The best comparisons for Isabella's set of plates are five plates made with the arms of the Medici Pope, Pius IV, who ruled from 1559 to 1566, and two with a papal emblem of cross keys are in the British Museum. I'm showing you one of them on the lower left. It's interesting that the surviving plates should be linked with the Medici family as patrons, which suggests the kind of prestige which glass commanded. I've considered some of the ways in which particular glasses can be associated through their imagery, decoration and functions with betrothal and marriage ceremonies as part of the social exchanges and gift giving which accompanied these rituals. But I've also suggested ways in which women were consumers of glass and could even be patrons and collectors with tastes of their own in commissioning pieces. The glass here 
needs a long and detailed look in its contemporary context if we are to understand the way in which it presents fascinating contemporary ambivalence towards Venetian women. The glass is a large goblet, it's about this high, with a deep, wide bowl, a hollow baluster stem, and a folded foot. On one side is enameled the figure of a woman in expensive Venetian dress, the stereotypical view of the kind of Venetian blonde beauty for which the city was famous. And in interpreting this image, we have to understand the social context in which it was made and used. On the back is a Germanic coat of arms, which has not yet been identified, suggesting that the glass was either made in Venice for a German client or made by Venetian glass workers operating in southern Germany. The glass is heavy and ponderous. Shakespeare's Portia in The Merchant of Venice decoys an unwelcome German marriage candidate with a deep glass of Rhenish wine. One wonders if this is the kind of glass, rather oversized glass, to which she's referring, associated in the minds of Shakespeare's London audiences with German drinking habits. Portia adds derisively to her maid, I will do anything, Nerissa, ere I will be married to a sponge. Shakespeare's a very useful guide since he used Venice, as did other playwrights, as a mirror for London. Using Venice in this way gave playwrights a certain psychological distance at which to probe issues of concern to London audiences. One of these was the sex trade and its impact on wider society, for one of the first associations which Venice had for Londoners was with sex and its availability, the famed beauty of Venetian women, the numbers of prostitutes operating openly in the city, and the supposed licentiousness of Venetian wives. This is the understood context for Othello, in which the virtuous Desdemona stands apart from the sexual stereotypes traded by Iago, Rodrigo, and Cassio until the distinct categories of whore and wife dissolve into one in the latter part of the play. The presence of Bianca, a courtesan, Cassio's mistress, is a key element in the sexual traffic that pervades the play. Iago comments, in Venice, they do let heaven see the pranks they dare not show their husbands. Their best conscience is not to leave it undone, but kept unknown. The Venetian print of 1578 plays up to this voyeuristic view of Venetian women. It shows a gondola with a closed canopy, which the viewer can then lift to show the canoodling couple hidden from public view. This image appealed so much to a German student that he had the print copied into his souvenir album in 1588, flap and all. However, the couple are not shown embracing, but singing to the accompaniment of a lute player. It's that sanitized version, which is also seen on this southern German pendant of around 1570, which is now in the Museo degli Argenti in Florence. And again, you'll have to excuse my photograph taken when I handled the jewel recently. The couple are partly hidden by the gold framework of the tent at the center, so you have to look for them. The pendant's very similar, and again, you'll have to take my word for it because I couldn't find a larger picture of it. Very similar to the jewel worn by Anna Maria, daughter of Duke William V of Bavaria, <coughs> in her portrait by Engelhard de Pey, painted in 1589. It's interesting that women as well as men seem to have enjoyed this imagery in Northern Europe. The adaptation suggests the interface between the way in which Venetians translated their city to visitors and the way in which those visitors wished to perceive it. The Venetian Council of Ten was concerned enough about what courtesans got up to in gondolas to patrol the canals in 1578, the year of the print I showed you. Just this degree of uncertainty about a woman's apparent virtue and transgressive inner nature is revealed in Othello's desperate remark to Desdemona when he accuses her of being a whore. I took you for that cunning whore of Venice that married with Othello. The Venetian sex, sex trade took place in full public view. Courtesans could flaunt themselves above the Ponte delle Tette, or Bridge of Tits, in the Sestiere di San Polo. A printed catalogue of 1566 lists 210 names of available women in Venice with prices and locations. At the top were the high-ranking courtesans like Vienna Borella near San Trovaso at the boatman's beneath, who charged 15 scudi, which was something like 15 weeks' wages for a skilled worker. Lower down the scale, at 6 scudi, were the women like Vienna at the Madonna dell'Orto with her housekeeper, who lived independently in their own apartments, as the courtesan Bianca in Othello appears to do. Cheapest at one scudo was yet another, Vienna, at San Felice, where you take the boat for the new houses beside the lower window. There are also prostitutes operating in the city's many brothels, but it was the courtesans who fascinated. Thomas, Cor Thomas Corriott dedicated plenty of space in his account of Venice to courtesans, claiming that he'd done his research by visiting one, but that he'd escaped unscathed. He writes that, the name of a courtesan of Venice is famous over all Christendom, 
and I have here inserted a picture of one of their nobler courtesans, according to her Venetian habits, with my own near unto her, made in that form as we saluted each other. Coriot describes the Venetian courtesan's taste for luxury, for thou shalt see her decked with many chains of gold and orient pearl like a second Cleopatra. And that always makes me think of this very strange painting uh, by an unknown Venetian painter showing a courtesan posing as the ancient Egyptian heroine Cleopatra, who famously preferred death to dishonor at the hands of the Romans. The fascination of Cleopatra down the centuries has been in her dual identity as queen and queen, Q-U-E-A-N, which is Shakespeare's slang for a prostitute. She was also renowned for her culture and her eloquence. The Roman Renaissance courtesan, Tullia d'Aragona, was described as talking with such grace and rare eloquence when joking that she drew and conquered the souls of her listeners like another Cleopatra. We could talk about the details of this woman's dress, note the platform shoes, and the interior in which she sits, but the point is that it's cultivated and luxurious. The courtesan shown is presumably the patron of the painting, is she? which makes it doubly bold and alluring. Visual stereotypes of Venetian women were widely diffused, copied, and collected in Northern Europe and formed an image bank for the outsider's view of Venetian society. Particularly valuable are the albums made up by Northern Europeans on their grand tour or gap year as souvenirs of their travels. These books include miniature paintings, mottos, signatures, and coats of arms, which present iconic images which had a special appeal to the young male traveler. This image in the album of Johannes Thomas Ortel, dated 1604, is striking in its similarity to the blue lady on our glass, although a puff of silk covers her plunging to cleavage in a telling detail. Courtesans in these images convey just that feisty independence which even the virtuous Desdemona reveals in banter with Iago. All the women in Othello are branded as whores. Iago gives Desdemona plenty of provocation. Come on, come on, your picture's out of door, bells in your parlours, wildcats in your kitchens, saints in your injuries, devils being offended, players in your housewifery and housewives in your beds. But going back to the women on the glass, the image has long thought to have been copied from a woodcut showing a Venetian noblewoman in Lent, which appears in Cesare Vecellio's famous costume book, Degli Abiti Antichi et Moderni di Diverse Parti del Mondo, printed in Venice in 1590. Her hair, which has been dyed blonde, is teased into a distinctively Venetian style of horned headdress of the 1580s and 90s, you've seen the style already, which helps to date the glass. Venetian women were known to take the shocking step of dyeing their hair. Blondness in women was a Venetian obsession. Vecellio says it took such art and effort and waste of time that it's mind-boggling. It was particularly fashionable as a preparation for marriage when blonde tendrils on the forehead and loose curls on the shoulders set off white bridal dress. Desdemona is described as fair in Shakespeare's play Othello, a word which equates blondness and pallor with beauty. Fashionable high status women took trouble not to tan, sometimes wearing a visit mask when outside in summer. This wonderful example was found in June 2010 in an inner wall of a 16th century building in Northamptonshire. And I don't know if you can see, again, it's very difficult to get a good photograph, but there's a little bead down where the mouth part is. You're supposed to hold the bead between your teeth, and then there's a strap around the top to hold it to your face, to protect your face from the sun when you're out walking. Amazing object, and only two of them survive. Dyeing one's hair was a Saturday afternoon occupation in Venice, as one sat on the rooftop platform known as a Maltana. Vecellio's illustration on the right shows a woman with her dyed hair spread over the brim of a hat without a crown, so the sun can bleach it. She's taken off her high platform shoes, or chopin, which is standing by her side on her right. These were worn as overshoes, but they had erotic associations since they were copied from the slippers worn in the Ottoman Turkish hammam. Going back to our glass, the woman here leans back on her hips because she is wearing chopin under her voluminous blue and white silk dress. If you look very hard, and I'm afraid I can't take this uh, in a photograph, um, you can see her Chopin or platform shoes peeping out under her dress at the base of the bowl. It's an important detail in interpreting the image. Venetian brides took great pains to learn how to walk and dance in these platform shoes so they could show off their skills rather than their Chopin at their wedding. Wearing high platform shoes allowed for longer dresses made from more expensive silks, which could cover the shoes and make for a graceful appearance. Showing off luxury cloth 
was an aspect of conspicuous consumption, which also demonstrated civic pride in Venice, making noble women on display a kind of walking mass of rich silks and cloth of gold provided by their husbands and their fathers. It reminds me always of Robert Herrick's contemporary poem about the erotic charge of women in silk. When as in silk my Julia goes, then, then, methinks, how sweetly flows the liquefaction of her clothes. Next, when I cast mine eyes and see that brave vibration each way free, oh, how that glittering taketh me. Couldn't resist that. <laughs> Unfortunately, the shoes hidden beneath these lengths of cloth, worn by Venetian women, were so high that brides could scarcely move in them without tuition and assistance from a dance master or ballerine. Giacomo Franco's print of a bride with her ballerine shows that symbiotic relationship very clearly. Dancing like music making was a desirable social accomplishment in a bride, as Othello recognizes when he agonizes about Desdemona's virtue. Tis not to make me jealous, to say my wife is fair, feeds well, loves company, is free of speech, sings, plays, and dances. Where virtue is, these are more virtuous. But that was just the point for these were also the kinds of skills which were thought to distinguish the courtesan from the common prostitute. As an English visitor, Thomas Corriott had no time for Chopin. He tells us how, I saw a woman fall a very dangerous fall as she was going down the stairs of one of those little stony bridges with her high chapinis along by herself. But I did nothing pity her because she wore such frivolous and, as I may truly term them, ridiculous instruments, which were the occasion of her fall. For both I myself and many other strangers, as I have observed in Venice, have often laughed at them for their vain Chopin. English men may well have sneered at these excessive platforms and the Naomi Campbell moments suffered by their wearers, but that didn't stop English women from wanting these shoes. Queen Elizabeth I had two pairs of slippers made for her in this Venetian style, laid on with silver lace, which probably looked like the ones shown here on the lower left, and those worn by Anne of Denmark, Queen to James I, in this portrait by Marcus Gerritz the Younger. The English poet Lady Falkland mentions disarmingly in her memoirs that she had long worn a very high pair of Chopin, as she was very low and a long time very fat. Quite how confusing these kinds of indicators could be is demonstrated in a Venetian print by Pietro Bertelli of a very special interactive kind, dating from around 1588. It might almost have been designed as an advertisement for the Venetian courtesan as a tourist attraction. The print shows a well-dressed Venetian woman with her hair worn in those two twisted peaks we've seen already. She stands with her expensive ostrich feather fan, pearls and a handkerchief in a recognizably watery Venetian landscape. Cupid above her indicates an amorous purpose, and her sidelong expression is at least suggestive. When the viewer lifts the flap of her front panel to her dress, her breeches, or braguesi, and her chopin are revealed. One Scottish Calvinist visitor to Venice, Sir Michael Balfour, on the grand tour in Venice in 1596 to 1599, had the print copied into his souvenir album as a permanent memento of his visit to the city. When Julia decides to set off for Milan to search for Proteus in Shakespeare's Two Gentlemen of Verona, her maid Lucetta counsels her to dress as a man in breeches and codpiece. Julia, shocked, how will the world repute me for undertaking so unstayed a journey? I fear me it will make me scandalized. She is the first of a long line of cross-dressed heroines, played by a boy dressing up as a girl dressing up as a boy. And the full charge of this experiment is only felt in the shock and titillation associated with real women dressing up as men, even if only in their underclothes, as in Bertelli's print. The English travel writer Fines Morrison describes in 1617 how the harlots called courtesans commonly wear doublets and breeches under their women's gowns. Yea, I have seen some of them, as at Padua, go in the company of young men to the tennis court in men's apparel and rackets in their hands, most commonly wearing doublets and hose of carnation satin. And that's exactly what this woman is wearing in this miniature. Are we meant to enjoy the witty conceit of the Venetian courtesan, who specializes in what Shakespeare's Iago calls a seeming? the notorious ability of the Venetian prostitute to emulate the ways and manners of respectable women. It was this very Shakespearean aspect of the glass which was brought out by Neil McGregor, director of the British Museum, in his examination of the glass for his radio series, Shakespeare's Restless World. She looks ready to have and to give a very good time. This is a glass that to anybody in Shakespeare's audience would speak of Venice. 
I think we're faced with an ambivalent image which owes much to the Venetian culture I've tried to describe and the world of the tourist and student from Northern Europe. The unspoken message of many of the student albums is that young Protestant men should not fall for these Catholic indulgences and should avoid illicit sex, especially on their gap year. Some of the student albums show moralizing images, the dangers of consorting with courtesans. In this miniature, a blindfolded man is being led into a woman's bedchamber. Note the chapine carefully placed by the bed as symbols of lasciviousness and titillation, which only the viewer sees. The idea was that such men should turn their backs on this kind of temptation, go home and marry a nice German Protestant girl, which is what is suggested in this image from a German album, showing a young German neglecting a Bolognese and a Florentine in favour of a German in the manner of the judgment of Paris. I just think that's gorgeous, that picture. The portrait of the noblewoman, you do look at the detail on the, on the right of the young German. The portrait of a noblewoman at the age of 29 in the year 1582, this is in the V&A, probably a marriage portrait, shows her in the fashions of northwestern Germany and closely resembles the figure of the young German woman in the album I just showed you. Her range of jewellery is that permitted by the Nuremberg Sumptuary Laws of 1583, two rings on each finger, a silver girdle, chain-link bracelets, and massive gold chains. All this jewellery signifies her wealth and social standing. It's beautifully set off by her sober black jacket, cut from the most expensive Italian velvet, worn with a skirt of brilliant red glazed wool with a pleated linen apron. She's the picture of legally defined, luxurious dress, ever restrained, Protestant kind. The young German woman in the miniature also resembles in her dress the young Clara von Romig as she was portrayed in 1589. Lorenz Strauch painted her at the time of her marriage to her fellow patrician of Nuremberg, Jakob Praun. Decorum and decency reign. And in a sense, that's what's presented on this pair of glasses made to commemorate the marriage of the couple. The woman's image on one of them derives from the Vicelio woodcut I showed you. The other glass in the pair is enameled with a male figure in German dress and both glasses bear the paired arms of the Praun of Romig families and Jakob Praun in gold. It's thought that the figures are intended to be read as generic portraits of the Nuremberg couple, Jakob Praun and Clara von Romig, when they married in 1589. Clara is shown in definitely Venetian luxury dress, perhaps because Jakob Praun, in commissioning the glasses, stipulated his own dress, but not that of his bride, or because the enameler didn't know Nuremberg fashions and we don't know where these glasses were made, in Venice itself, as many still claim, or in Northern Europe, the jury's out. But wherever they were made, the two glasses reveal the role of Venice and Venetian culture, art and fashion in the European imagination in the years around 1600. So I hope I have indeed introduced you to wine, women and the glory of Venice and helped you to see just how marvelous Venetian glass can be as an indicator of contemporary morality and wit, as well as being beautiful in itself. I've talked about women as consumers, patrons, and collectors of Venetian glass, and I've discussed women as makers, muses, and icons. The intersection between Venetian glass and the society it expressed and served is a little-known element of Renaissance culture, one which demands a lot more study, and which can take us, I believe, to the heart of Shakespeare's Europe. Thank you for listening. Other parts is like just uh, a ring on top or 
but in the two plays that was so significant. I, um, I, don't, kind of I don't really know why they do that, but the, the, what they love with the turquoise glasses is a very small group of the pieces, so they all have the same aesthetic. So they have this absolutely brilliant turquoise, which is like the very, very best Khorasan turquoise stone. You know, the brilliant turquoise from the old, what's it called, the old mountain, Sheila, you know, what's it called, the old mountain, the Turk, old turquoise okay. is cut from the old mountain, and it's known as that kind of turquoise. It's absolutely brilliant, it's not green, it's blue. Um, and then they often use trails of white around the lip and around the foot. And sometimes they use lapis lazuli glass to offset. I think the purpose of the white is really just to offset the turquoise and show up its brilliance. And the, and the point is technical as well as aesthetic, because turquoise glass, and we know this because um, William Goodenrath, who is a master glass of Corning, who you know, um, has actually reconstructed a lot of the Renaissance techniques used to make glass, and I asked him to reconstruct um, this glass for the gallery, you know, as a, as a video on YouTube, and you can all of you watch it if you want to see it. And what we discovered from that, and from the, and now analyzing the composition of the turquoise glass, is that it's extremely difficult to handle and manipulate, because, it, because of the copper that you have to put into it and the alterations you have to make to the chemistry to bring out that color, it becomes extremely difficult to handle, and when you're blowing it, it suddenly collapses. And so actually manipulating and blowing it to the degree that you see on that glass is an incredible technical achievement. It might only take 15 minutes for a glass blower to make, but that's a master glass blower based on you know, 30 years of practice and experience. Um, so I think that the white dots are just aesthetic, just to show off the brilliance. And you do get those white dots used on the other colors for similar reasons, but it, it's a very particular aesthetic. And for a long, long time, with that, with that turquoise glass that I showed you, people thought it was fake because there were so few comparisons that they thought it was something made for a Rothschild in about 1850. <laughs> and so you can't imagine what it was like um, having held the fragments of our piece in my hands uh, and really felt, I mean, imagine if you could actually feel inside the plastic of this glass. You know, you get to know how it feels and, and how it handles. And to go to Padua and see these pieces that had just come out of the ground from this luxury convent and to feel exactly the same fracture, exactly the same thickness of the walls of the glass, exactly the same colour and the same bubbles in the glass was an incredible thing because it just proved that it was a genuine piece and that it was from the same workshop. There's no doubt about that. And that was a wonderful moment. So there's a lot of guesswork, I'm afraid, but also experience in handling and different things to bring into play. I hope I gave you some sense of that, but I was trying to bring a narrative into it for those of you who don't know about glass, in the hope that it would be more inclusive and more interesting, and I, I hope that's true. Any other questions? Comments? Andrew, can I Andrew down the end. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. Um, can I ask what, what, what is known about, about the mechanics of selling or, or of acquiring, you know, um, in terms of female um, patronage, how would they actually have acquired glass? I mean, they would have had agents, presumably? Well, the, um, uh, Lorenzo de Pavia is a good model, I think, for probably what was done. You know, you had some agent who was actually stationed in Venice buying you all kinds of luxury goods, and that this would just be one aspect of what they'd acquire. That's certainly true of Lorenzo de Pavia mm. and his letters with Isabella going back and forth. Um, but no, we don't know very much about that at all. I mean, I, I don't know of any evidence that suggests that women are buying directly at the censor fair. But perhaps they did, or perhaps they went with their husbands, brothers, fathers, and, and bought things with them. I don't really know. Um, there's a lot in the documents about commissioning of glass from the various glass houses, um, and women aren't mentioned directly in that. Um, so I think orders placed by women probably went through their agents or went through particular dealers, just as they would in later periods with other kinds of art, art, artifact. But you can probably comment on that as much as me. <laughs> yeah. And just, just uh, another question. Um, to, to, what extent, how, how, to what extent can one distinguish types of glass that were for use and then were actually collected? Um, I know, you know, Philip II had a one collection of ice glass, you know, in this country. So, so the particular kinds of glass that were clearly collected, but is there a... How easy is it to distinguish? Oh, they're huge. There's huge, huge variety of different grades of glass. I mean, most of the stuff you get in excavations does not 
like this. Um, the number of pieces from London excavations that can be at all compared with anything that I've shown you is incredibly small, for example. And it's really only in English excavations in London, Southampton, and one house called Acton Court in the West Country, um, which has amazing glass thrown into its moat um, yeah. after a very drunken visit by Henry VIII with Anne Boleyn, <laughs> when you know, he's just got married in 1535 and they have no money, so they go on a progress expecting their courtiers to give them a good old time. <laughs> and they went to Acton Court, and the patron at Acton Court was a very advanced Protestant like Anne Boleyn. And um, he's painted by, he's beautifully drawn by Holbein, uh, when he points. And he bought the most incredible glass and myola curve for the royal visit which was just used you know, for this wining and dining, and then a lot of it got broken and thrown into the, um, not even into the moat, but into a particular pit, which means that it's in a dated context. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the few places where one can actually date the most luxurious Venetian glass. But in those excavations, you also get much lower grade glass, not only Venetian, but from forest glass houses all over Central Europe, you know, that is definitely not Venetian in composition or design. So there's an enormous range in the kinds of glass and the types of glass. That would be several other lectures if I were sure. to try and, and mm -hmm. talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, but even in Venice itself, there are huge different gradations of glass, obviously being made by the different glass houses. Mm -hmm. um, most of the documentation concerns the really luxurious glass houses. Um, and most of the glass of the kind I've shown you is the sort that's been treasured from the moment it was made and has never gone underground. Yeah. And, and would some of these marriage classes have been commemorative? And, you know, would they have been kept as a sort of symbol? Well, I think the, the Beheim ones probably yeah. survive because yeah. they were treasured as being precise records of a particular marriage in the family, um, even though it was a childless marriage. And, um, but you know, the silver that we have uh, from the Tuca family and so on seems to be preserved with the same kind of interest. I mean, Nuremberg people really did keep their things together. So I wonder whether in that case uh, the pieces survive as, as a pair of beakers, because otherwise glass is very rare to survive like that. Um, as I explained with the um, other glasses, we don't know that they're betrothal pieces, but it seems very possible that they might be. Um, and I think that finding other uses for those glasses, particularly the blue one I showed at the beginning with the inept triumphal imagery on it, mm. Um, if that had a lid, like the one in the Louvre has, um, the, the fact that it might have been used for confetti, such as you do see in paintings, and is very well documented, might mean that one might find some kind of reference to glass being used in that way. But we don't have one as far as I know. Maybe one of your students will find one. <laughs> There was another question. You had a question. I yes. have a kind of a similar question, but more about the different types of luxury glasses. Um, I know that adding enamel to a glass can increase its price exponentially, but I was wondering if you knew of a price difference between the different colors, so between, say, a crystal glass and the emerald glass that you showed earlier. I don't know of anything in the documents that says anything about that. Um, and I mean, that's why I tried to give a more impressionistic picture from the fact that the turquoise references are really rare, whereas other kinds of blue glass are frequently mentioned in the records, enameled or, or not. Um, so I do think it's something very special. Uh, but actual prices, no, I'm afraid not. There was a question at the back. Yeah, Dora, I wanted to, I, I love the way you use the album Amicorum, these what you call gap year <laughs> records, um, very, very cleverly and I think aptly. Um, to, to sort of give evidence. I wonder, are these, is this the tip of the iceberg that you're showing us? Or are these, are there lots, lots more sources that could tell us about this interaction between these young German sort of adolescents and these Venetian courtesans? I mean, is there, is there a lot more stuff on this? Is, is there a novel there? <laughs> I'm sure there's a novel. There always is a novel, but um, I'm I'm not aware of there being lots more. I'm sure if one found um, more letters from students, that there would be plenty of evidence mm -hmm. there. I mean, you often get tantalising references to women's names used in such a way that it pi appears that they are courtesans. I'm sure you you know about this. They appear all over the place, um, but I just find those albums particularly fascinating, mainly because once. Um, I was allowed to go into the British Library stack where these albums are kept. And there is 
there are two or three long shelves of these albums from the 16th century and early 17th century. And I just sat on the floor and looked at them. And it was quite incredible. And I'd never seen anything quite like it. Um, so I've been interested in them for a long, long time. And I just love to use those images. Um, some of them are quite well known. You've seen them in other books and so on. Some are not so well known. Mm. But I just think linking them. I was very excited when I, I saw the link with the jewel that I was handling in, in Florence. I think maybe one could do a lot more to build up a texture, building out from those albums to objects and places and things and people. But it would need more years than I've got to do. And again, perhaps somebody else will do it. There was a question at the back. I think I understood to say that glass workers could not work more than seven months a year. Was this meant to keep production down and prices high? Yes. Yeah. And also to avoid the plague. You know, there were many different reasons, and to save money on raw materials and furnaces and avoid fires breaking out. I mean, every kind of reason. But uh, the Council of Ten was not very good at controlling what glassmakers did uh, because the numbers of them in communities that we can document both from archaeology and from documents and from surviving glasses, is really very fascinating and from the 1540s. In 1548, they try to get back. The Council of Ten actually write to Venetian glassblowers in London trying to get them to come back because they're working illegally in London. And they write back saying, uh, sorry, can't leave. We're on a three-year contract. <laughs> you know. And we actually have two little glasses in the British Museum which we think may have been made by those very glass workers because the glass is absolutely distinctly Venetian composition, but in a northern European shape. They're little bellied um, beer pots. Mm -hmm. And they've been set into silver mounts, which have London hallmarks for 1548 to 49. So the temptation to link them with that group of recalcitrant Venetian glass workers refusing to go back to Venice because they're on a lucrative business mm -hmm. working for rich London merchants is too tempting for words. But of course, I may be completely wrong, but that is one interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but they weren't supposed to work more than those few months. They were desperately trying to, to control these people because they were such an important part of the Venetian economy and, and Venetian status um, across the whole of Europe, really. Glassware was, I think we underrate it desperately in our historical accounts of, of the period. It was incredibly important. Um, it always appeared and, and shown off at diplomatic visits and, and you know, commission, special commissions of Venetian glass had very high status at this time. There's a question here, Peter. Yeah. <clears throat> this was a very Protestant talk. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's sort of Venice as Bangkok, circa 1600. <laughs> but I'm wondering if the sources were not Protestants with their fantasies of the yes. South, yes. whether the picture would look the same. So have you looked at Spanish travelers, Ottoman travelers, or indeed other Italians, uh, or Frenchmen? Peresc is in Venice at exactly this time for two years. Uh, and there's no reference to any of this demi -mode. So the question is, yes. to what extent are the sources creating the narrative? Yeah. I think that's a very good point and quite possible. Um, but since the stuff I'm dealing with is that interface between Northern Europeans and Venice, I find it particularly fascinating. And the, and the whole Shakespeare picture appeals to me. Um, Spanish sources, I think, take the same rather critical attitude to Venetian women. It's not just um, that it's Protestant men criticizing Catholic culture, though that is an important spin on it. I think Spanish Catholics, um, you know, Venice is generally seen as the luxurious city for whatever religious denomination. I don't know about Ottoman Turkish visitors. Um, I mean, what sources are you suggesting one should look at? There are, there are travelers, there are ambassadors. Yes. Well, I would love to look at them. I mean, if you suggest some, I shall go and have a look. Um, but as for the Spaniards, um, I have read Spanish travellers' accounts, and they also talk about the prevalence of the sex trade and the Venetian women. So I think that's a really interesting point. I shall go back and try and think more on it. Mm. Any other questions? Points? I was really intrigued by your reference to the two female enamelers um, yes. in the Venetian archives, and I was wondering whether there's any more information about women's involvement um, in the making. 
Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Is there anything more you have? And what was the, uh, was there a, a guild that controlled the enameling of glass? Or um, were they allowing women to practice? Or what's... It's all very mysterious because there are just a few references. And the names of the women are Elena de Landa, Marietta Barbier. And they're in the Zekin published documents if you want to look them up. Um, and this is about 1490 to early 1500. Um, and it seems from these rather puzzling, and they're all in lawsuits, uh, usually between, they belong to glass making dynasties. So they are on, married into the trade or born into the trade. And so that would imply that they might have been able to do little bits on the side, but knowing what one does about other guilds. Um, but in a rather unofficial capacity, perhaps that's why the lawsuits are there, perhaps that's why we know anything about them. But with Marietta Barovier, it describes her working at a very small furnace, and it's not quite clear what that was, whether she had blanks from the workshop that she enameled somewhere else and whether where they were fired. It's just littered with question marks. Um, but I don't know if there being more evidence to find. It would be very nice if I could point you there. But if you're interested, just have a look at those fantastic documents by Paolo Zekin, which I think there are three or four volumes of them, which he published. is a great labor of love with all the different references you could find in the Murano archives, Venice archives to Murano glass work, work and mm -hmm. you may find more there. Other questions from the floor? Thank you. I, can't okay. help I, I, I was okay. very struck by the comparison with Carpaccio of, of, the, of the heads and I just wonder, is, is the... Um, I mean, how, how direct do you think that is? I, mean, I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. Um, the first person to comment on that was the wonderful Tim Clark, yeah. um, who was a collector of glass and an extremely clever, independent-minded scholar. Um, and in fact, he was the person from whom we bought in 1979 that wonderful little white glass flask with the portrait of Henry VII on it. That was from his collection. And he had an extraordinary instinct and a very good eye. He'd worked in Christie's for years. Um, and he came up with these, some of these close comparisons. I'm only just following on some of the stuff that he's done. I just um, wondered if there are any sort of other demonstrable links between the painters and the glass well, makers. No, there, well, the, 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 just the evidence is, it's so, is so scarce. I mean, I've really tried to suggest what I can from the evidence, but I can't do more than that. Oh, um, but it, it makes sense that this is, this is the feminine ideal, and oh, yes, sure. you know, I mean, mar good marketing, uh, you know, right. in those very years uh, of this elite glass, you might well think that you know Carpaccio, Carpaccio's particular take on those beautiful women with their particularized dress yeah. um, is absolutely perfect, and there's a sort of slightly militaristic quality too, which also helps. But the woodcuts from the Hypnorosha uh, are also very prevalent, and Mochetto and other engravers have a part to play. Yeah. I think there's a lot more work that could be done um, looking at the possible sources. And sometimes the sources are absolutely clear. It's, you know, there's no doubt at all that a particular print has been used by an enameler on a particular glass. Um, I haven't shown those because they're not part of my talk, but there are some very precise comparisons that can be made. But I think more could be done, and I, ho I hope someone will do it. All right, well, if there are no further questions, uh, you may ask Dora informally over please a do, glass of wine, kick, kick off your Chopin, and join us <laughs> in the gallery out here. Yeah.